this refusal to coordinate with the Palestinian Authority, and given the strength of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, would eventually lead to Hamas um, ruling the Gaza Strip. That is, of course, exactly what happened. And more importantly, I, I would argue, that is what the Israeli political and security establishment aspired to. Because while they may not have a soft spot for Hamas, um, while they may detest Hamas, they considered Hamas rule in the Gaza Strip a price worth paying for the more important strategic objective of keeping the Palestinians weak and divided. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Artifact 54. Today, I'm joined by Muin Rabani, who is an analyst of the Middle East in general and Israel-Palestine more specifically. The first time we had a conversation was actually in almost a year ago, actually, uh, uh, December 2022, with Norman Finkelstein, Muin, and other Palestinian refugees. And the reason why I wanted to do that conversation is I, I definitely had an uneasy feeling about the Middle East, simply because it was too quiet, at least superficially, despite the fact that at any given day, you could find expulsions of Palestinians, uh, ethnic cleans cleansing going on, you had violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. So it, it definitely felt like something big was going to happen. Uh, we had plenty of Haaretz uh, headlines, for instance, all through 2023, indicating things like, you know, there might be a, another intifada coming, something is coming, something is coming, and then October 7th occurred. And uh, Muin actually also just, uh, he contributed an essay to a, a book that was just released by uh, Or Books, that's O-R Books, uh, titled Deluge, Gaza, and Israel from Crisis to Cataclysm. I'm actually going to order it uh, after this conversation. I'm going to use it for a video essay that I'm working on on Palestine. Hopefully it's going to be done sometime the end of January. Um, and maybe we could just sort of start the conversation where we uh, left off uh, last December. Do you agree with my assessment that um, what felt at the time was just this kind of like totally untenable, uneasy piece that really was not a piece at all? Like it, it seemed as if something uh, big was, was uh, happening. And maybe what were your feelings uh, at the time? Yeah, first of all, it's uh, good to be with you again, and and I completely agree with your assessment. As it happens, um, I wrote an essay um, also either late last year or earlier this year uh, for the Middle East Council on Global Affairs, looking at the Biden administration's policy or lack of, lack thereof um, towards the Palestinians, and I characterized it as one of strategic neglect whereby um, uh, the U.S. basically took the position that the Palestinians can be safely ignored, um, that the U.S. can focus on issues like Arab-Israeli normalization, not as part of a comprehensive Israeli Arab-Israeli peace, but rather in order to further marginalize the Palestinians and leave them at the exclusive mercy of Israel to um, resolve its differences with the Palestinians by brute force unilaterally on the basis of um, the gross imbalance of power between them. And I concluded that this strategic neglect was um, uh, driving um, the region towards an abyss at increasing speed. I, of course, had absolutely no clue um, about how this was going to erupt and explode, but it seemed fairly certain um, that um, uh, that the situation was untenable over the longer term. And I think it's in significant part in that context that we have to understand the horrific uh, crisis that we're experiencing now. And so immediately prior to um let's we'll just say October 7th. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I recall reading, um, there was an essay by 
the uh, Jewish, uh, you could call him, you know, he's he's somewhat a pretty uh, pro-Palestinian now. He maybe started 10, 15 years ago, uh, fairly on the side of Israel. But Peter Beinart uh, in America, he wrote this essay in 2020 on Joe Biden's uh, policies towards Israel. The fact that during the Obama administration, he was just very much intent on taking some of Obama's instincts on the matter, such as, you know, uh, I'm not sure how serious Obama was, but Obama, uh, the received wisdom at least, is that he uh, had a soft spot for Palestinians and um, Biden was kind of instrumental in pushing him further and further uh, right uh, on that question. So, um, and this was, you know, this was written, I think, even before uh, the election occurred. Uh, but anyway, so let's say a, a year or two, maybe three years prior to the, the Hamas attack, uh, what were the significant uh, events leading to it? Um, was there any kind of pushback uh, within Israeli society or Israeli government against some of the more, you know, obvious flagrant abuses of power, such as the fact that, you know, uh, just, e e you know, even before uh, October 7th through 2023, we had at least dozens of Palestinians, uh, it seems, that were killed in the West Bank. There was settler violence. It doesn't seem like anybody ever gets prosecuted unless maybe there might be some sort of, um, you know, like maybe throw somebody to the wolves, right? In the same way that there was a prosecution for the use of Palestinians as human shields by Israel during Cast Lead. Um, but there, you know, it's kind of like essentially a slap in the wrist. So what were those substantial events and what was the the, the response of Israeli society? Because because one thing that is kind of interesting to me is how um you know, if you were on social media for the last few years, you could not be pro-Israel in any kind of way because for years at that point, it's not as if Palestinians were very, very seriously resisting the occupation, right? All kind of world opinion was on their side. And honestly, even after October 7th, I, I thought it would take longer than a week for Israel to be completely, you know, a pariah again. But, it, you know, it was it was more or less a week. So what were those uh, events leading up to October 7th that stand out in your mind, maybe then or perhaps in retrospect? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Peter Beinart's essay because purely by coincidence, I came across it um, last night. And he makes the argument that um, in the Obama administration, Biden was basically Netanyahu's point man in, in, in the administration. And that... Um, uh, it was Biden, more than anyone else, who um, repeatedly argued against um, any uh, measures, no matter how benign, that the U.S. may have been um, considering um, to not so much to change course, but at least to address the worst excesses of Israeli policy towards the Palestinians. And this included, for example, announcing major settlement expansions, just as Biden's plane was landing in uh, Tel Aviv, he was consistently arguing um, for the U.S. to use its veto power in the U.N. Security Council against so much as a slap on Israel's uh, wrist. And I think the article is interesting, not only for what it tells us um, about the Obama administration's um, policies towards Israel, but also about the current crisis, because during the past year, and particularly as um, Netanyahu has been um, promoting his uh, legislative agenda to overhaul the Israeli judiciary and essentially um, transform Israel from an ethnocracy into an autocracy, um, we've constantly been hearing reports about uh, um, how much the Biden administration and Biden personally mistrusts Netanyahu, um, that they even um, detest him as an individual. And, you know, when you read these the article and you look at the current policy, you can only come to one conclusion, and that is that Netanyahu must be thinking, well, with enemies like these, who needs friends? Um, and to get to the second part of your question, I still don't have an explanation for the timing of Hamas's uh, attacks on October 7th, because on the one hand, um, they don't appear to be in response to a specific event or incident. And at the same time, I think it's important to recognize 
that preparations for these attacks um, must have started before the current um, radically extreme right-wing government uh, led by Netanyahu uh, took office. All indications are that the um, preparations for this attack, or at least the conception for them, began in the aftermath of the 2021 Unity Intifada, which I think is significant because that represented the first time that it was Hamas rather than Israel that initiated an armed confrontation um, uh, between the two. And it's also significant that Hamas initiated that confrontation for reasons that had nothing to do with Israeli policy towards the Gaza Strip or Israeli policy towards Hamas. Rather, Hamas was responding to growing Israeli incursions and provocations at the Al-Aqsa Mosque um, and the Haram al-Sharif um, in the um, uh, old city of Jerusalem and intensified Israeli settlement activity in East Jerusalem, in the Sheikh Jarrah uh, neighborhood in particular. And I find this, this is significant because um, what we saw afterwards was that things went back entirely um, to what they were before. In other words, um, Hamas will have concluded that the initiative it took in 2021 at the end of the day changed nothing and that they therefore had to do something more genuinely um, spectacular in order to address the status quo. And I think they took the decision that they needed to do something to irretrievably shatter it. Now, what were their um, uh, motivations? Well, um, again, I would point to the intensified Israeli unilateralism by which um, Israel, with the active support of the US, with the passive acquiescence of the Europeans, increasingly turning into active support, um, Israel was basically seeking to um, resolve the question of Palestine unilaterally on the basis of the gross imbalance of power between the parties, seeking to secure its own claims and interests through the application of brute force without any reference to either Palestinian rights, Palestinian interests, not even um, going through the motions of seeking to negotiate with any Palestinian party. It was basically, you know, seeking to um, uh, implement its own version of how this issue should be um, permanently resolved. And I think that's one issue that um, um, Hamas sought to address. Another one is we have to remember, this is an Islamist movement. And when they say things about um, rejecting growing Israeli encroachment on the Haram al-Sharif and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, perhaps um, some people will now, with the benefit of hindsight, conclude that yes, um, we should have taken them seriously when they said that these are issues that go to the very core of, of their uh, being and um, interests. You mentioned the growing um, intensification of settlement activity and uh, um, army and settler violence and ethnic cleansing in the West Bank, particularly in the Jordan Valley and the South Hebron Hills and so on. Um, those were also serious issues. Uh, but overall, I think um, Hamas was looking for a way to once again place a question of Palestine and Palestinian rights at the center of the agenda. Um, and, you know, um, uh, however one evaluates and assesses uh, its attacks of October 7th, I think we can at least conclude that they have placed uh, the question of Palestine after a long absence, after a period during which many people had concluded, well, um, it's gone and gone forever. Um, this is not an issue we probably ever have to deal with um, again. It's now been at the very center of the planet's attention um, for well over uh, for well over um, uh, two months. And again, um, these are not responses to the policies of the present government. Um, the difference between this government and its predecessor is really one of degree 
rather than of kind. And if we look at how um, uh, the West particularly was engaging with this issue during the past year, Palestinian rights virtually, or Palestinians for that matter, virtually never entered into the equation. The dialogue between the Americans and the Europeans on the one hand and Israel on, on, Israel on the other was almost exclusively about Netanyahu's legislative agenda with respect to the Israeli uh, judiciary, because that would have affected the democratic rights of Israel's Jewish citizens. That was a genuine concern that alarmed Western capitals to no end. But, you know, Palestinians, well, they're irrelevant human scum um, uh, and their rights and uh, what's being done to them by the Israeli army and its settlers. Well, that's not really something that was a particular concern um, to the European Union, least of all to the U.S. and so on. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's kind of telling that uh, in all of Israel's history, um, the uh, Israeli protests, uh, the popular protest protests against the Netanyahu judicial reforms, uh, these were, uh, if not the biggest, then some of the biggest protests. And it's kind of telling that you you never had protests that large, um, pretty much ever, right, R related to things like Arab rights, Palestinian rights. Uh, equality, anti-apartheid, right? They, they these things seem to be kind of like more and more fringe issues. I mean, I remember when I was in high school and I first started reading about Palestine and I started getting in, in, interested in the conflict, and um, I, I was reading stuff that was already like very quickly dated, right? And the world was kind of like passing me by in a way that I, I couldn't quite tell. I remember uh, when Omer came to power, they were talking about a two-state solution, and it was obvious that it was not you know, tenable, uh, a two-state deal, like it would never actually work. And, you know, all of that was just kind of like, it was feeling kind of like, like I was sort of aging out of this kind of discussion. And before you know it, we're left with a de facto one-state solution. Um, and uh, I, I want to return to this idea of uh, degree versus con, but before that, uh, just to give a little context. So when you termed, you know, encroachments on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, if you look at like videos from 2021, 2022, um, on the, you could find on Twitter now, uh, this is what I was referring to when I said you couldn't be, you know, credibly pro Israel on Twitter back then. Cause it's like, all that you saw were videos of, you see like some old men at this mosque, just literally just doing nothing except praying on a prayer mat, doing nothing. There's no activity, right? There's no, you know, militants. There's nothing. Like they're literally just praying before you know it, you hear like a bang, you have, you know, IDF storms in, or rather, uh, I guess the police forces storm in. Uh, they literally start kicking these old men over uh, completely unprompted. Obviously, nobody's going to get punished. This is really uh, the kind of thing that was going on every single day. Um, and uh, uh, I have a question about, so like uh, uh, one thing that Muin also does on Twitter now is uh, he's definitely one of the best writers of Twitter threads on just like if I have any, like if there's some sort of issue that that's come up in the Middle East, uh, he's definitely one of the first pages that I turn to because he will no doubt have an interesting thread that has perspectives that even, you know, uh, I'm, I'm pro-Palestine, so is Moulin, obviously, but he he offers things that I don't necessarily think about. And one thing that surprised me was um, you said something like, you don't really accept the idea that uh, a large part uh, of the motivation for Ham the Hamas attack is to like, you know, uh, stall or to totally, you know, get rid of the normalization agreements uh, that was going on with uh, Saudi Arabia at the time. And now there seem to be more or less off the table. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, sure. on that? Sure. I mean, many, many um, observers and analysts in the wake of um, the attacks of October 7th, again, I think because there really wasn't a compelling explanation for their timing, it's not as if they were responding to something that happened on October 6th or um, September 6th. Um, and so these these attacks, in a sense, could have just as easily taken place a month earlier um, or a month later and left us with the same questions about timing. And I think probably in that context, quite a few observers and analysts pointed to um, uh, the efforts to achieve a Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement as a primary motivation for Hamas. In other words, what Hamas was hoping to do with this um, um, attack, not exclusively, but primarily, 
was to um, scuttle the prospect of such an agreement being reached and consummated. I have my doubts for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that, it, that the issue at stake was never a Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement, or rather it was never just a Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement. It was really a tripartite agreement between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United States, which was a central party to these um, to this um, uh, agreement had it come to pass. And why was it a central party? Well, because the main benefits Saudi Arabia was seeking to der derive from such an agreement would have come not from Israel in terms of anything Israel would be offering to either Saudi Arabia or to the Palestinians, but they were rather American commitments that Riyadh was seeking. And these concerned a formal American security guarantee for Saudi Arabia, akin to security guarantees it gives to its um, formal allies to defend them from foreign attack and aggression and so on. And, the U and Saudi Arabia was seeking a nuclear reactor with uranium enrichment uh, capacity, civilian, um, uh, but a nuclear reactor nonetheless. And so what that means is that no agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia would have been possible unless the U.S. Congress, which would have, been, which is the body that would have had to confirm these American commitments and approve them, without the approval of the U.S. Congress for these um, uh, commitments to Sa U.S. commitments to Saudi Arabia, there would have been no Saudi-Israeli agreement. And in my view. Um, given opposition within Congress to either Saudi Arabia or the Biden administration, or both, and given um, uh, the very um, trenchant criticisms and even vilification of Saudi Arabia's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, among um, uh, quite a few members of Congress, um, I reach the conclusion that those commitments were not going to emerge from Washington. A second reason that I didn't think, <coughs> excuse me, a second reason <coughs> that I didn't think um, this agreement would come to pass is because part of the package also consisted of Israeli gestures towards the Palestinians, so that the Saudis, um, who face, I think, um, um, a much more engaged and complex public opinion than does, for example, the United Arab Emirates, um, so that the Saudi authorities could claim that they were not selling out the Palestinians, but benefiting the Palestinians by reaching an agreement with Israel. Now, it's true um, that these Israeli gestures towards the Palestinians were primarily cosmetic in nature, but it's also true that this Israeli government is constitutively incapable, allergic to making even um, uh, superficial cosmetic gestures to the Palestinians, quite the opposite. It's going out of its way to provoke them, uh, to um, disempower them, uh, to unleash the violence of the army and its settlers against them and, and so on. And so I, I do think part of the Biden administration's calculations was to go to Netanyahu and say, well, you have to make these gestures towards the Palestinians. And if you can't get them through your current government, then you should change your coalition partners. Well, even there, there's two problems. First of all, it's not just um, uh, the radical right-wing members of the government who were commonly described and in some cases um, describe themselves as fascists that are opposed to these gestures. Netanyahu himself doesn't believe in them. But more importantly, he was not in a position to change the composition of his governing coalition in order to make these gestures, because had he done so, his legislative agenda with respect to the Israeli judiciary, which is of such political and personal significance to him, would no longer um, be viable. So 
my initial assessment was that neither Saudi Arabia nor the nor Israel, for reasons of their own, were um, in a position to make the commitments for such an agreement. But going beyond that, even if I'm wrong, um, and let's assume for the sake of argument that this agreement was a viable prospect and was even imminent, um, I'm sure Hamas would have taken 10 minutes out of its preparations to study how previous armed conflicts have affected the process of Arab-Israeli normalization. And here we have concrete evidence. So to take the first and most important Arab-Israeli normalization agreement, um, the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty of 1979, which removed the most powerful um, Arab military and what was at the time the most consequential Arab state out of the Arab-Israeli equation and enabled Israel to unleash its um, 1982 invasion of Lebanon to seek to eradicate the PLO. Well, the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, culminating in the Sabra Shatila massacres in September of that year, had no impact on the process of Egyptian-Israeli normalization. Um, Secondly, if we uh, look at um, the late 1990s and the Second Intifada, these had no impact on um, either Egyptian, um, uh, Israeli, or Jordanian Israeli normalization. One could even go further and say, well, even the PLO didn't withdraw its recognition um, uh, of Israel or renounce the Oslo Accords in response um, to uh, to Israeli measures during the Second Intifada, up to and including uh, the construction of the West Bank Wall. And most recently, um, we have the normalization agreements, the grandiosely um, uh, entitled Abraham Accords, which remained entirely unaffected uh, by the 2021 unity um, uh, uprising, uh, as it's called. So I think, Hamas would have recognized that the most they could have achieved with the attacks of the 7th of October would have been to postpone the consummation of any um, uh, Saudi-Israeli uh, normalization agreement and to postpone it only for the length of a decent interval once the guns fell silent. And with this knowledge, it seems to me a reasonable conclusion um, that Hamas would have decided that that wouldn't be um, uh, worth the effort or worth the price. So I do think that, you know, the regional acquiescence um, uh, in is Israeli unilateralism towards the Palestinians was a background factor and perhaps even an important background factor. But to identify the prospect of a Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement as a prime motivation for uh, Hamas uh, um, to conduct its uh, attacks, I think, is, is really um, a very serious misreading of, of reality. I want to briefly return to uh, this idea of uh, different uh, Israeli regimes are you know, the the difference among them is one of a degree and not of kind. I think this is something that gets uh, very much underrated by, um, you know, lots of observers simply because, you know, just kind of um, think about, you know, the formation of Israel, right? You have uh, people like David Ben-Gurion, who he's supposed to be a so-called socialist leader. He was one of the people, for instance, that helped, you know, shape the ethnic cleansing uh, policy. Um, we have uh, the fact that, uh you know, there seems to be this kind of like logical conundrum of, okay, if you do want a two-state settlement, uh, what exactly is that going to look like if, in fact, you wish Israel itself to remain, you know, like a Jewish majority state? If you have like a robust, peaceful Palestine, right, to your uh, uh, east and essentially to your west, um, what is that going to mean in terms of like intermingling, right? Are, are young Jewish boys going to sneak out in the middle of the night and go to a beach in Gaza? And suddenly you have this mixing that lots of people in Israeli society don't want to see, right? So I think there's a lot of uh, resistance to a two-state settlement, even among so-called liberals. You had a Twitter thread where uh, you talked about uh, refusing an interview with 
the Deutsche Well media outlet. And Deutsche uh, Welle. yeah. Yeah. And, and so so basically I I saw one of their documentaries on the Hamas attacks and the kind of peace activists that they were interviewing. Uh they're not exactly what I would call peace activists, right? But because uh, it, it's so right wing and has progressively gotten more so in, in Israel, right? That's just kind of like where where the population is. Well, and I mean, I, th yeah. I think in Germany today, um, Itamar Ben Gvir is probably uh, considered a peace activist. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, notwithstanding. But to get to your question, I mean, we we don't have to go that far back into history. Um, let's look at something that's currently very much in the news, which is um, why has Hamas managed to rule Gaza since it seized power there in 2007 um, without being overthrown by Israel um, during years when everyone who has given even a cursory look at the situation would have immediately concluded that had Israel decided to overthrow Hamas um, and end its rule over the Gaza Strip, it could very easily have done so. Well, what we saw in the aftermath of October 7th is something that I would call Netanyahu derangement syndrome, um, a bit similar to uh, Trump derangement syndrome that you've had in the US, which is that you look at Israel and you hold Netanyahu personally responsible and accountable, exclusively responsible and accountable for everything that went wrong. And one of the chief indictments against him is that he, quote unquote, strengthened Hamas and financed Hamas. Well, the reality is a, a little different. In 2005, Israel, under the leadership of Ariel Sharon, um, conducted its so-called disengagement uh, from uh, the Gaza Strip. And without getting into details of what that meant and didn't mean, um, Israel decided to withdraw its settlements and military basings from the, from the Gaza Strip and control the Gaza Strip from the outside. And as part of that process, and despite urging from its allies in the US and Europe, the Sharon government systematically refused to coordinate its disengagement with the Palestinian Authority. Um, it insisted on doing so unilaterally, and this goes back to the earlier part of our discussion. And already in 2004, 2005, um, you could see articles by prominent commentators in the Israeli press, and also, I should add, um, uh, among others who often had a better understanding of the situation, that, that this refusal to coordinate with the Palestinian Authority, and given the strength of Hamas in the Gaza Strip would eventually lead to Hamas um, ruling the Gaza Strip. That is, of course, exactly what happened. And more importantly, I, I would argue, that is what the Israeli political and security establishment aspired to. Because while they may not have a soft spot for Hamas, um, while they may detest Hamas, they considered Hamas rule in the Gaza Strip a price worth paying for the more important strategic objective of keeping the Palestinians weak and divided. In other words, even though um, the Palestinian Authority has over the years become what can only be described as a subcontractor for the Israeli occupation, the, the Israeli um, uh, leadership preferred having the PA in power only in parts of the West Bank and Hamas in power in the Gaza Strip, rather than having these two territories unified under the leadership of the PA, even though the PA is much more amenable to Israel's agenda and interests. Um, and when this happened, uh, the Israeli prime minister, if I'm not mistaken, was Ehud Olmert. Um, and in 2008, 2009, during the first um, uh, Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip, Hamas was, I mean, to, to say um, Hamas at that point that the Qassam Brigades were a weak, third-rate, ragtag militia would, if anything, um, be an understatement.
and the Israeli military could have very easily overthrown it in, in, in the course of a single day had it so uh, chosen. But it didn't for the reasons that I've just outlined. Um, this was a policy that wasn't formulated by Netanyahu. This was a policy that was inherited by Netanyahu and he continued to implement it. Similarly, when he was replaced by um, Naftali Bennett, um, the same policy continued. With each um, armed confrontation, with each Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip, Israel has systematically refrained from seeking to overthrow the Hamas government because it preferred Palestinian um, uh, division. Um, and similarly, did, Hama, did um, uh, Netanyahu fund Hamas? Not at all. What Israel did is it approved the transfer of Qatari cash to the Gaza Strip um, to prevent a complete implosion of, um, um, of the situation of society in the Gaza Strip to keep it just above water so that it wouldn't drown um, because Israel determined that that was in its best interest. I mean, you can't, you know, convince me that Netanyahu is the only adherent of this policy, that everyone else, you know, from the generals to his coalition partners to everyone else opposed this, but was somehow powerless um, uh, to change course. So the point I'm trying to make is, you know, there are strategic decisions that are implemented virtually identically across multiple successive Israeli governments of quite different political color and composition. What we're constantly hearing now is that the only reason this war is continuing is because Netanyahu needs the war to stay out of jail. Well, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, of course, there's going to be accountability at the end of this war. And regardless of the severity of his failings, Netanyahu is not going to be imprisoned um, for Israel's failures on October 7th. Um, yes, Netanyahu is ultimately um, responsible for Israeli uh, policy, but the ones who are going to be held primarily responsible for the Israeli military and intelligence services collapsing like a house of cards on October 7th are the generals, not the politicians. And while you can make a persuasive argument about how it's in Netanyahu's personal and political interests to continue this war, I would argue the ones who have an even greater interest in continuing this war until something, anything is achieved are the generals because they are the ones who are seeking to conceal the stain on their reputation that they incurred on October 7th with massive amounts of Palestinian blood. Um, and it's simply, you know, it doesn't stand to reason that one person in a political system like Israel's can force its entire leadership, all its central institutions to pursue a course of action that they all oppose for reasons that everyone understands to be the narrow political partisan interests of one individual rather than a national policy. And besides, you know, even Netanyahu and his generals, uh, there's also a third factor, which is it really does seem to me that Israeli society craves this kind of war, um, at least in the sense of, you know, there's a reason why the IDF is really releasing images of, you know, stripped Palestinians, mostly uh, civilians, if not all uh, civilians, being humiliated, being tortured, being uh, led. Like if you saw some of those pictures from 2015, 2016, uh, you would think like, oh, yeah, of course, like another ISIS, you know, a photo shoot before either an execution or a mock execution. And they're just proudly disseminating all of that. The IDF is to Israeli yeah. society, right? There's a reason for that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned because because there is an overwhelming lust for revenge and an overwhelming lust for revenge in a society that has moved decisively to the right in recent decades and is increasingly moving to the far right. And I think here there's an interesting comparison to be made between Israel and the U.S. Um, the U.S. had a similar um, uh, widespread widespread 
uh, popular lust for revenge after 9-11. And the U.S. government at the time was able to exploit and manipulate um, uh, that popular uh, lust for revenge to divert American energies into a prior longstanding U.S. policy goal championed um, mm -hmm. by the neoconservatives, which was to invade and occupy Iraq and overthrow uh, 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 the government of Saddam Hussein and so on. And it was able to successfully do that. But when you compare these pictures um, to the pictures that emerged out of Abu Ghraib, there's a fundamental difference, which is that even under Donald Rumsfeld, um, the Pentagon tried to conceal the pictures um, and, and videos from uh, Abu Ghraib. And when they were finally released, they caused popular disgust and popular outrage. Um, and you had vast swaths of the American population saying, you know, this isn't us, we don't want anything to do with, it, with this and so on. Um, I don't want to get into the details and the accuracy of such sentiments, but that is how many people responded. In Israel, the military is not seeking to conceal these images, but it's, it's promoting them and publicizing them and marketing them. And the response to them has been overwhelmingly responsive. So I think, you know, that's an interesting comparison to make. Maybe I know that you're running a tight schedule today, so maybe we could just close out on uh, the question of, well, because I, I remember we uh, briefly talked about this uh, two months ago. I, I asked you, well, what changes exactly? And you said, I can't even begin to say what the changes are now in the Middle East. So two months in, uh, what exactly has changed? And does this, uh, are the changes related specifically to Arab responses to Israel normalization, uh, among other things, or is the change long term going to be more so the fact that America is just no longer a credible uh, player or broker of peace um, in the Middle East, right? It can't be considered objective any longer by anyone who matters. And that's a huge problem, right? We have 2 billion Muslims. We have only 18 million Jews, half of whom, by the way, are very skeptical of, um, you know, different degrees of skepticism of, of Israel and apartheid and all these other illiberal projects. So uh, what is your take on the situation going forward? Well, I, first of all, I, 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 I would reject, um, uh, um, you know, t seeking to divide this into, for example, uh, Muslims and Jews, because you have uh, quite a few Muslims who are passionate advocates um, and allies of Israel. Think of Azerbaijan, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example, and then um, uh, you have uh, uh, Jews uh, that are, you know, <laughs> fundamentally and principally opposed uh, to Zionism. So I don't think that division works very well. In terms of um, your question, I would say in, in, in the immediate term that what started on October 7th and developed into an Israeli war on the Gaza Strip has now become not just a regional, but an international crisis. And here I'm referring specifically um, to recent developments in the Red Sea and um, the U.S. Um, uh, formation of a uh, coalition of the willing, uh, let's call it, of primarily Western states under the rubric of um, um, Operation Prosperity Guardian, which is meant to ensure that shipping can continue uh, to access the Red Sea and via the Red Sea, the Suez Canal. And it's quite interesting because, um, you know, um, uh, the Yemenis, are not closing the Red Sea to international shipping. What they are doing is they are um, blocking all ships, regardless of the flag they're flying, um, uh, that are either um, uh, docking or leaving um, the Israeli port of Eilat. And more importantly, they have said that they are doing so exclusively for the purpose of compelling Israel um, to end its onslaught at the Gaza Strip and lift its siege. And the United States and its partners um, seem to believe that the prospect of another war with Yemen um, 
um, in order to give Israel the um, uh, the ability to continue with this war and siege is preferable to ending um, Israel's uh, genocide um, uh, so that shipping in the Red Sea can return to what it was on October 6th. So uh, anyway, I, you know, without getting, I, I maybe went into too much detail, but the point I wanted to make is you had an Israeli-Palestinian crisis that very quickly escalated into a regional crisis with the prospect of um, uh, erupting into a full-fledged regional war. And now on top of that, you have another layer, which is that you now have a genuinely international crisis. Uh, that's one consequence. Um, the second one is, um, uh, I would argue that this war represents the final nail in the coffin of the rules-based international order um, in the sense that, you know, I don't think people were ever particularly persuaded by it, um, but it's become so openly transparent that the rules-based international order is a fiction constructed with the West for the sole purpose of serving its own interests at the expense of everyone else's, that no one is ever going to take U.S. pontification um, uh, about human rights and international law and democracy and this and that seriously ever again. I think, you know, if, if in the past people felt compelled that they had to take U.S. and European criticisms about these issues seriously and provide them with substantive responses, I think moving forward, and rightfully so, any um, any uh, U.S. or or European pontification of this issue will be contemptuously um, rejected and uh, dismissed with a simple reference to Gaza and um, U.S. and European complicity and active participation um, uh, in in genocide. Um, and the third one is, as, as you suggested, um, that the U.S.'s uh, um, reputation um, and influence in the Middle East, uh, such as it was, I think, has now been permanently um, erased. And the question moving forward is, is to what extent, to what degree will this translate into um, the U.S. U.S. interests in the region also uh, being affected because the phenomenon I'm describing exists very much at the popular level, but has yet to translate into either the adoption of these attitudes and sentiments um, by governments in the region um, or a situation in which governments that or and leaders that do embrace these um, sentiments and attitudes replace existing ones. And those I think are much more difficult questions to answer. Well, thank you, Moeen, for uh, doing this. Hopefully, uh, maybe uh, next month or so, I, I should uh, uh, finish that book. Maybe we could get you and perhaps some of the other writers involved uh, to do a discussion here of the contents of the book. Um, I'm looking forward to reading it. So thank you for taking time out. Uh, to join me here. Thank you guys for sticking uh, through with everything and we'll see you soon. Thank you.